Welcome back to another episode of the Behind the Wall podcast, sponsored by Campus Steaks. It's a Philly thing. Check them out downtown. <laughs> Steve Jones coming in today. Steve. Landon. Thank you so much for coming in, man. You are an abs- absolute legend around these parts in, in State College. So I was thinking about it, and I remember you always saying to us, you're like, man, you, you guys are going to take my job one day. You guys, <laughs> you guys are getting ready. You guys are good at speaking. And uh, here we are. So I figured, I said, hey, I got I to gotta have him on. Right. So he comes into State College, and I remember running into – Landon and his father at Walmart. I, dude, I had that on my paper. I was gonna, He beat me to it. I was about <laughs> to bring it up. Go ahead. You can right. tell the story. No, we, just, we went in there. I was in getting whatever, right? And I think you and your dad were in there getting supplies, mm, <laughs> right? And I said, you're going to have a great career here. I can't wait to watch you play. And before everything happened, you were having a great career. So you Thank were you. you were backing up everything I thought. I appreciate it. I was going to write that down. I was like, <laughs> my first interaction, I just got here, uh, moving into Martin Hall, and it was still COVID time. It was it was a weird time period. Yeah. And me and my dad, sure enough, went up to get some some boxes, some food at Walmart. And I just hear, hey, are, are you Landon Tangwall? And then I, I honestly, I don't really think I knew Steve was at the time. Right, yeah. And then I asked around, and they're like, dude, that's Steve Jones. I'm like, oh, man, okay. <laughs> but that's what I wanted to ask you about. Like, you already knew who I were mm-hmm. and, and had that all mapped out. How much time and effort does it take for you to have all the names, all the backgrounds of, of these mm-hmm. guys memorized? Is that something that you do when they first come in? Or like, how, did, how does that process kind of look well, for you? It's more just a process, land that of going to practice every day and being around everybody. Mm-hmm. That's a big part of it. And that pe- people say, how often do you go? Well, I do go every day because if you don't go every day, you're going to miss something. And mm-hmm. part of it is making sure that you know who everybody happens to be. So it really pays off not just on game day, but it pays off when we do quarterback club together. You guys look at me and you know that, okay, it's Steve, it's fine. Because mm. you're going to be, especially the first time, you're going to be nervous getting up in front of everybody. If you have a familiar face up there with you, mm. it's going to allow you to relax and be more yourself. So it really pays off in a lot of ways. And that's where I really get to the notice, okay, first team, second team, third team. And getting ready for opposing teams, I do a lot of work at this time of the year. Uh, I just finished literally USC this morning. Uh, I'm working on Wisconsin starting tomorrow. I do them in chronological order. And I do the same thing with basketball. That way I start the season with all the basics done on every team. And then I can concentrate on game week, on watching film, on, you know, changes that they may have had to their depth chart and so forth. So you try to put a lot of work in. But look, when the game starts, you're just calling the game. And all this work that you put in, you may use 2% of it, you just don't know which 2% of it it happens to be, and it changes every week. Yeah, you, you got to be ready, that's for sure. You you were talking about USC, and I, through my research, correct me if I'm wrong, but your first football game calling for yeah. Penn State in the Meadowlands in, in New yeah. York, Penn State, USC. Can you take me back to that a little bit? Were, were you yeah. nervous? What, what was that first call like against USC? Okay, so Carson Palmer was the quarterback. Troy Palomalo ran an interception back for a touchdown. But I was working with Jack Ham for the first time. Mm. And there was early in the game, David Royer went back to punt. And uh, and Frank Strong blocked the punt. And Sean Guillory picked it up and ran it back for a touchdown. And I was able to get the block punt and the return all in one fell swoop. Look, I got lucky. Strong was number one and Sean wears six. Mm. So it's not, they weren't that far apart on the number chart. And Jack talked about that play for a couple of weeks. Like, the way you got that so fast, I won his respect on that Mm. play. And it's interesting how it's in a game that ends up 29 to five. It's not a great game. Penn State does not win the game. But that play, two to two and a half minutes in, won the respect of somebody that I was going to end up working with for a minimum of 25 seasons plus along the way. And that, that was one of the more important plays of my career out of that game. That's that's an awesome story. I wasn't expecting that. I mean, so, you know, talking about working with Jack Ham, obviously an absolute legend. I'm a diehard Steelers fan. So, <laughs> when first off, when I got here, I didn't know that Jack was around either. So, it was it, he was sitting in the back of the bus with us one day. And I, someone was like, yeah, Jack's back there. I'm like, Jack who? 
Like Jack Ham. I'm like, what? Are you serious? Like Jack Ham is on this, like the Steelers legend is on this bus. So uh, that, that dude, that has to be kind of a little nerve wracking, I'd say, for someone of that magnitude. But I don't, I don't know. You're calm, cool, collected. Uh, but but kind of overall, what was that? What was that like coming in, working with Jack, and what have you learned from him since in these 25 uh, plus seasons go, going on with Jack? So I'll do the the learn part second. I'll start with him. He is so down to earth that he has no ego at all. You wouldn't even know that he attended the Super Bowl, let alone been on four teams that won it. You'd never know that he went to the Pro Bowl, let alone the fact that he played in it nine times. Right? Gold jacket, right? College football Hall of Fame. Again, he's just a down to earth guy and he doesn't like being around people with big egos because he doesn't have a big ego. He has no ego, none at all. So he's the greatest guy on the planet to work with. What do I learn? A long time ago, my father told me, Landon, that always desire to work with people who make you better. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. no matter what people think of me, good, bad, indifferent, I'm way better because I work with Jack Ham. I'm way better in basketball because I work with Dick Girardi. Those guys make me better. Now, in turn, it's also my responsibility to make them better. I mean, that's a responsibility to make them better. But during the course of the game, he'll see everything. As I'm following the ball. And he has a perspective that is unlike anybody else as an analyst. I mean, there's some great analysts out there, but I'll listen to games on Sirius XM and nobody's in his category. Mm -hmm. Nobody is. And I always tell my broadcasting class at Penn State that one of the more important things that you do, whether it's an interview, whether it's doing a game, is listening. I may have a speaking job, but listening is the most important part because he could say something that takes the broadcast in a great direction. James Franklin could say something to me in the pregame show that I can follow up with the next question, not just sit there and think about the next one. Right? And that's where the listening part comes in. And listening to Jack, well, it's well worth the time. I, look, I'm the one that gets to sit there for three and a half hours with the best seat in the house talking football with Jack Hand. Yeah, you, you, I mean, that's you, pretty good, that's say, a pretty lived, good you, life. He lived the best <laughs> life around, Steve. That, that sounds like my dream, especially growing up as a child. I mean – what more could you ask for? It's like, not and, bad. Yeah. and I, I know about, you know, being next to someone that makes you bad. I played next to Olu Fashion. Sure. So I, I right. know what that's like. When you're next to someone that is yeah. you know, a great, it, it makes you better all around. Oh, no that, question. That is for sure. How often talked about, you talked about, you know, you recognizing me in Walmart. How often are you recognized around state college? Cause I, I uh, you know, you're the voice of Penn state. So I know sometimes, you know, people don't uh, know exactly what you look like, but how, how often would you say that happens? When they do see me for the first time, it scares them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> That's what he looks like? Really? Uh, no, I, people, they're all really nice to me. So, that I mean, I get treated so well here by everybody. It uh, is. It's, it's a special place. So, uh, it, it's a really yeah. cool place to be, uh, and I somewhere I, I want to stay just from, from being here a couple well, of years. I mean, look at, your, look at your own personal life. I mean, you know, with everything ups, you know, ups, downs, and so forth. How much support did you get from people along the way from here? That's just oh, the way the community is. They're, it's a great place to it work. Is. I, I talk about it all the time. I mean, the support that I had from lettermen to fans to business owners around mm -hmm. town to not even business owners that are Penn State alums saying, mm -hmm. hey, you need an internship, you need right. something help in the future, hit me up. I, I will always say I, I'm a Penn Stater for life, yeah. and you really feel yeah. that Penn State family when yeah. you become a part of it. Yeah. Uh, Go check out Campus Stakes. I mean, they're right behind you. Hey, they, they, yeah. they support the guys, man. Yeah. We, we love like Steve with the, with the Campus Stakes plug. I love it. Steve, I, I want to go back. Take me back sure. to a, a young Steve Jones. Oh, you get boy. your first what, – what was your first, like, real gig that, that you did where you – it was the first time you were live uh, on air? I was a sophomore at Penn State Wilkesbury campus. Mm. It was 1977, and I did some news and sports. But my first game was December 8th, 1977. It was at Lake Lehman High School, which would be Connor McGovern's high school. Mm. Right? Connor's dad's still the athletic director there. Wow. Uh, you know, and uh, Nick Urie, right? Mm. They're, they're Lake Lehman guys. 
and Penn State Wilkesbury played Allentown Business School, and we broadcast the game on a 10 watt radio station that I think you lost in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, not many people got to hear the game, uh, huh? No. And so Penn State Wilkesbury won the game like 119 to uh, 101 or something like that. And I remember Bernie Janowski was our player of the game because he had 30 points. And when I walked out of the gym that night, I thought, now this is what I want to do the rest of my life. This was really, I had a blast. And it felt like it went by in five minutes mm -hmm. instead of two hours. I just had, thought, this is a great job. Because growing up, I'd listen mm -hmm. to games on the radio land and, and mm -hmm. like, oh, man, what a great job. You get to go to the game. I never once really thought that they gave you money for it. <laughs> <laughs> I get to get paid to do this? Wow. <laughs> and they give me money, too? <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. What well, Growing up, you said you so you listened to a, a lot of oh, radio yeah. uh, sports, all that type of stuff. What was Do you have an influence in particular that made you want to get into the field of, of broadcasting and radio? Well, growing up, I grew up in New England. So in growing up in New England, everybody was a Red Sox fan. Well, my brother's a Yankees fan, but that's <laughs> that just, blood, that just gave blood. that just gave the house balance. Uh, <laughs> and so I'd listen to the games on the radio, but then I would listen to KDK in Pittsburgh uh, because all these clear channel AM stations, you know, Bob Prince listening to Chuck Thompson do the the Baltimore Orioles, Jack Buck, Joe's dad doing the St. Louis Cardinals on KMOX. I'd hear all Legend. these games at night. And I thought, this is great. It was mostly baseball. But then I started listening to football. Then I started listening to basketball. Now we had Johnny Most. Johnny Most. <laughs> 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 ah, the Celtics. Ah, yeah, a bunch of actors in this league. Uh, and I'll give you a really great Johnny Most story. So the Celtics, back in the 80s, if you were the NBA champion, you played in the McDonald's Classic which was the NBA champion against the European champions. So the Celtics go over, it's like September, and they're going to play. And they got Bird, Mikhail, mm. and they're playing against a team from Serbia. And I'm listening to the game, and Johnny Most, and Bird and Mikhail, Mikhail lays it up and in. He says, Celtics lead by 40. Here's number four up to 12, 12 back to seven, seven over, and 12 shoots. And goes, 12's a good shooter. He didn't know any of the names. He just did the numbers. <laughs> just, he didn't like, bother to learn the names. Like, what the heck? We're not going to do the names. <laughs> well, some of the names, you said it was like Serbia? Oh, yeah. Oh, those are probably some tough names to, oh, to, to get down sometimes. Uh, in the 80s, I did a, a on TV Penn State men's volleyball against the Japanese All-Stars. And... So somebody said, how are you going to do this? Because it's not as if I can walk up. Like, like I'll, I'll walk up to guys at practice, and I'll say, hey, you know, give me a road. Like, Amani or Uwarie. Amani, how do you pronounce your last mm -hmm. name? Okay? And after five tries, I can then try it on the air myself. Well, it wasn't, this wasn't the case. They didn't speak English. So I said, I'm just going to keep it consistent. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh, that's too funny. Yeah, I, I can imagine that gets you in a little bit of a pickle, man. Uh, no, you you make sure like, it, but you know what? Let's go back to something that's really important. So about names and something again, I'll tell the broadcasting class: take care of the little things, mm. and the big things take care of themselves. So you want to make sure that you get the name right. I mean, even if it's the opposing team, you want to make sure you get the name right, because say for example, we're sitting in Beaver Stadium. And they're the family of the opposing teams in there, and they may be listening to the game. Well, you don't want to get the name wrong, right? And that's important. It's important to the family, the Absolutely. friends, or it could be a family and friend listening to us on Sirius XM, mm. you know, somewhere. So you want to make sure you always get that right. So I'll check with the opposing announcer. I'll say, hey, Paul, how do you say, you know, Marvin mm. Harrison's name. No, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got Harrison down. We're yeah, yeah, <laughs> a couple times. We're pretty I, good. Everybody's tired. Speaking of Marvin Harrison, I, I was so tired of hearing the, the Maserati Marv uh, from <laughs> – that's, that doesn't ring uh, good. It, it sounds good, but to, big, to Penn State fans and other Big Ten uh, fans – you, you didn't like to hear that in in the fall, man. Yeah, but see, I don't do nick. I don't do nicknames. You're not a nickname guy. No, okay. I don't do nicknames. I mean, in other words, I'll ask. Like, here's a simple one. All right, I'll, I'll give you two simple ones: Adrian Amos, and I'll give you Nicholas Singleton. Okay, so I'll start mm. with Singleton. Everybody's Nick, Nick, Nick. Mm. And then I saw that it was Nicholas, 
on the roster. So I pulled him aside one day in practice. I said, hey, I said, what do you prefer, Nick or Nicholas? He said, well, I'd actually rather be Nicholas. I said, well, so, it, so be it. So that's, that's why I say Nicholas Singleton on the broadcast because that's, awesome. that's what he wants. Right, so I'll ask you guys what you want. When I didn't have to do that with you because it's pretty obvious you want to be Landon. Right. Adrian Amos, we had an assistant coach, Tom Bradley. Right, Here, there, there's the guy you got to get on your show. Yeah, you will. Right, because Scrap will do it. Mm. And he starts calling him Amos in practice. Well, then Joe Paterno starts calling him Amos, and then all the players start calling him Amos. So I'm thinking. A-M-O-S, what the? So he's a freshman, and I can tell in practice that mm. he is going to play. Right. One formula, he may be a nickelback, whatever, mm. but he is going to play. So he's standing on the loading dock, well, at least, you know, where they load the tractor trailer now. There used to be a loading dock there. And I was leaving one day, and I said, let me ask you something, Adrian. Everybody's calling you Amos. I said, is it Amos? Or is it famous? Or is it Amos like famous Amos cookies? He says, "It's Amos." I said, "Well, why are they calling you Amos?" He said, "Well, Scrap started doing it, and then everybody started doing it." I said, "But it's Amos." He says, "Yeah." So I call him Amos on the broadcast. I had fans coming up to me. He says, "Why do you mispronounce his last name?" I said, "I'm not." <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I said, "I said he's the one that told." Really? You mean all those other guys are getting it wrong? I said. Yes. <laughs> yeah, dude, that happens a lot. I think there's a lot of people out there that they don't realize they're saying last names wrong. And I, I, I think you might know this one, but our one of our guards, Vanga. Oh, Vanga Yawane. Why? How say one, one last name one more time? That's my one of my best friends. I still can't say his Venga last name. Vanga Yawane. Yawane. A lot of people don't know. They call it's V E G A. Yeah. People just call him Vega. And we call. So we're in the film room yeah. for eight months at this point, and Trout goes, "Wait." Your name, you're, it's Vanga, like yeah. with the N in there. He's like, yeah, yeah. It, it's Vanga, not Vega, and it, like, we've been sitting there for eight months calling him <laughs> Vega, and his name's Vanga. So yeah, you definitely you gotta ask guys what, what their name is. I like that. I like you pointing that out. Uh, but you were talking about earlier about you teaching your your own class here at Penn State. Yeah. How long have you been a? Are you a professor technically? Oh uh, no, I mean, calling me a professor is an insult to professors. <laughs> they, oh, so they just <laughs> let you teach your own class? Huh? I'm just a lecturer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I got up there like you know. I've been doing it since 2003, okay. and I've been teaching sports broadcasting. Now, I'm probably near the end of that, mm. you know, that that run, but I've enjoyed it. We've had a lot of great people come through and have done great work. I mean, Amanda Lockwood is in charge of ESPN's uh, college football broadcast. She's in charge of it. She was actually in my first class here. I mean, all the way up to Hannah Mears, who's the sideline for the Pittsburgh Steelers. She mm. took the class as well. Michael Robinson oh, took yeah. the class. Right? Michael was great in the class. He was tremendous. But I, I've been fortunate. I've had a lot of great students. It's been fun to talk with them and give them my experiences and and tell them what I think is the right way to do it. You know, and and I teach them the way I was taught. My um, mentor was Gil Santos, and Gil did the New England Patriots for 40 years, including wow. their first three Super Bowl wins. But there was a period of time where WBZ in Boston lost the rights to the uh, Patriots. So for four years, he did Penn State football, and I was the third announcer on it. So I was sitting in a living, breathing play-by-play classroom. And he pulled me aside one day. We were going to make a trip to Alabama. Uh, and he says, I want to hear your high school tapes. I said, geez, okay. So I gave him a tape of a game. So we're sitting at the airport getting ready to go down to Tuscaloosa, and he looked at me and said, listen to your tape. I said, yeah? He says, I thought you'd be good. I, I really did. I didn't think you'd be that good. <laughs> I, and I looked at him and went, now the confidence he gave me when he said, he said, now let me go through a couple things. Maybe I'll try and tweak this on a kickoff, mm-hmm. say, you know, which direction the ball's going, which I still do today because he told me this. The little things. All right? The little, the little things. And that's how I teach the students. I always tell them first what they're doing right because I love that. I want them to build confidence so now they know they're doing something right and they can build upon it. And then when I tell them, okay, now let's talk about maybe you ought to try it this way. Not like 
man, you stink. You ought to get out of this. You know, I'd, <laughs> if I were you, I'd find the new major. No. <laughs> right. Steve, man, I, I, I love that you say that. I am so big on, on that. And I, I think we're in a world where, you know, especially football in the past, it is a freshman comes in and you rag on him. You, you, <laughs> you know, you let him have it. You do not get prop him up to, you know, in any way, so yeah. to speak. But I, that really is the best way to do it. Is pr- I, I think of it as praise, correct praise. Yeah. You know, hey, you did a really good job. Next time you can do X, Y, Z, but I really like that rep from you or whatever it was. I, I think you're dead on there, and that's how you get the most out of people mm-hmm. when you let them know, hey, you're, you're doing good. You're doing good. Let's just fix, tweak a couple things. Yeah. But uh, that's that's awesome to hear that that has stuck with you yeah. uh, from from there on. But teaching since, well, you said 03, you ever had to reprimand anybody, get you know a Steve Jones uh, uh, you know curse-out session? No, no, I haven't. Uh, but I've told them um, from time to time, that I, I've told them from time to time, number one, I said, you're not good at multitasking. Because they'll be in there and they'll start looking at their phones oh, yeah. and, and so forth. I said, I know you think you're great at multitasking. I said, but I can tell you no in certain terms you are not. And then I'll give them a, a specific example. I'll say the last assignment was supposed to be two minutes, plus or minus five seconds, so 155 to 205. I said, a couple of you handed it in. One was 137, the other one was 145. I said, do you think you did a great job of multitasking? I said, I even wrote it on the board. Uh, that's how you. That's how you really let it let it sit on people and kind of gets gets yeah. in there and makes them feel bad. Yeah. When, when you don't just yell at them, you kind of you make them feel a little dumb, and it's like, oh man, I should have I should have done better. I should I should have fixed that. So I've done that. I, you know, and I said, look, you. I said, you need to concentrate on what you're doing in the moment. So we don't have the blue line in the practice field now, but Joe Paterno had a blue line, and his whole point was when you cross the blue line. All you can do is football. You can't do anything else about classroom. You can't do anything about if you're having trouble with your girlfriend or whatever it may be. You have to go out. And he says, and how are you doing? Now, when you cross back over the line, he says, sure, there's some football things you can take care of. But you can take care of all the other stuff. So I try to tell him, when you come into the classroom, I said, look, I only got you for 55 minutes. I said, this is not exactly the Batan Death March. I said, <laughs> I said, so, I said so don't worry about it. I said, you know, I said, I said I'm not going to take up the whole time anyway. I said, just mm-hmm. listen to what we have to say. I said, and if you have questions, I said, there's no such thing as a bad question. I said, that means you have doubt. We need to clear up doubt. I said, and I guarantee you that there are four other people in the class that had the same question. They just were hesitant to ask. Steve, you sound like a fantastic teacher. I don't know if you're still. I, I'm gonna try to get in, get in one of your classes. I got two semesters left, so yeah, I'm, right. I'm gonna try to get in there. We can have a good time. Uh, I, I do want to ask though. So you officially took over for Penn State football in 2000, right? When did you start getting involved? And obviously, basketball. You've been involved since 1882. Yeah, and I and I was 82. I, I filled in for a couple of games in 81. Okay. Uh, and then they were like, okay. And then I got in 82. Yeah, good enough. Yeah. <laughs> Guy's passable. He serves. Well, I mean, look, I mean, I've, this will be my 43rd season doing basketball. Wow. And uh, no job advancement. No. <laughs> <laughs> no I nowhere just, to go I from do there. The same thing every year. <laughs> uh, and I, uh, and the next year in 83, they, they had an opening for a third person on the football network. So that's how I got into the football network. And Gil Santos and John, John Grant in particular was the one that recommended, hey, how about Steve Jones? You know, and my job was the third person was the pregame, postgame, halftime. So I do all the pregame interview with Joe, postgame with Joe, do halftime during the game, scores of other games, whatever. And then finally in 2000, the door opened up. And I was able to get the play-by-play job. And it's what I always wanted. Mm. And people have asked me about pro opportunities. And have I had other opportunities? Yes. Um, And I always said no because I think everybody in this business has what they perceive to be the best job. And for for the vast majority of people, it's ESPN. Mm -hmm. It's NBC. It's CBS. Right? It's Fox. For me, this was always the best job. Right? This is always the, you know... you know, and, and it's been the right choice because, you know, 
I think of all the people I've met over the time here, you know, guys like you, all right, all in the way. You know, and you represent hundreds of football players I've met. You represent hundreds of basketball players along the way. And when we talk about, like, a family, yeah, we all have our families, all right? But this is also a family. And so when I see an Adrian Amos, like a John Carter, a LeVar Arrington, whomever it happens to be, man, they treat you like you're a long-lost brother and vice versa. Same thing in basketball. I see Lamar Stevens. I'll, you know, I'll see mm-hmm. Josh Reeves. I mean, you know, these guys may be playing in the NBA or whatever now. You know, I've seeing Andrew Funk, who's now with the Bulls, and Jalen Pickett, who's with the Nuggets. And they're out of Michigan State, you know, for a game back in January. And, you know, and they act, everybody acts like they're family. Same thing with the coaches. I mean, the coaches have treated me so well here. I mean, everybody has. I mean, all the way from Dick Harder in basketball all the way up to Mike Rhodes, who's man, Mike is just tremendous. Oh, I'm really excited about what oh, he's doing. I'm a huge Mike, Mike Rhodes fan. Rhodes. You know, from Joe to James. Mm. I mean, I've really, I've, in a lot of, you know, and then I work with Jack Ham, I work with Dick mm. Girardi. You know, I'm trying to think what I accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of riding on everybody yeah, else's right. coattails. No, Steve, Steve Jones is a legend in his own right. But uh, talking about you you being a legend, what was it like to take over for uh, Fran Fisher? And then it was yeah. George Paterno, too, at the time, yeah, right? You know what the funny thing about it is? I never thought about it. Really? I, I think what really helped was that Fran and George retired on their own. Right? Nobody went up to them and said, hey, it might be time now. They didn't. They Fran had thought about retiring in 97. Mm-hmm. He had thought about it because they were talking with me at that point about then. Right. And I said, okay. Well, Fran decided to come back, and I remember they talked, they talked to me about it. And I said, hey, look. I said, when you've done everything he's done, I said, I said he should have the time to call – when it's time i said i said i'll support him 100 percent. and i said and the next time up i'll apply for the job again all right and they looked at me like okay well he retired on his own so nobody forced him to do it or anything like that he felt it was time so when it was time for me to take over i didn't really think about i just thought like okay this might this you know this is like i I didn't think about it as my time i thought about it as our time right it was natural yeah right it was jack and i together Mm -hmm. this is our time we get to start together all right and i thought well this is our time but it's not about us it's about it's about the team it's about the coaches it's about the fans and we're the conduit between the game and the fans it's not today's game starring us Right? It's the stars are the coaches, the players, the game, the atmosphere. And it's our job to relate all of that in such a way where the fan can better understand the game. That's where Jack and Dick come in. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. And that you know, and that people can have uh, get a greater appreciation for it by listening to the broadcast. So I never really thought of it in, in those terms. It was like, okay, you know, let's go. Let's see if we you know, let's you know. Let's get out there and get this done. Yeah, no, that's that, that's really cool because I think it's hard when you follow and to not have to think about it like that, where you just you just hopped right in. But to follow in someone's footsteps who is a legend, oh, yeah. it, sometimes it's hard, and that can even get that can kind of affect your mental a little bit to the point where it's like, hey, I don't I don't know if I'm going to be able to do as good of a job. And you know, mm-hmm. obviously, legends in their own right. But Steve came in, and uh, he's an absolute legend here at Penn State. So we're yeah, we're really thankful to have him. Steve, we're almost done here. I want to ask you two things. First, sure. I heard you golf. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I, I just got to ask, I, how, how do you look out there when you get on the links? The, the whole team mm. has gotten the golf bug ever since NIL started. These yeah. opportunities started to come about with charity events and these, mm. these rich business dudes inviting us out on the golf course. And we're like, man, we don't have any clue how to golf. <laughs> like, We need some help. So we got into it. But I, So I, I've golfed six times in the past week. I'm curious, how often do you get out there, and what, okay. what is it looking like when you get out on the okay. tee box? No, number one, what's interesting about watching football players golf is you may act like you don't know what you're doing, but you hit the ball 5,000 miles, okay? 
Now, the second shot also goes 5,000. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. You, you hit a good drive, and then you either chunk the wet yeah. shot or it, it just, you thin it all the way onto the other hole. So I got to a point in the late teens, like 17, 18, 19, something like that, where I was probably an 11 handicap. Wow. Like, oh, no, even I was like, wow. <laughs> you were looking around <laughs> impressed. Like, like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> I hit that ball. And then... In 2000, 2001, 22, 23, I can tell you right now, I flat out stunk. <laughs> like, bad. Like, like, it's a humbling game, too, well, I'll tell you I, what. I, I, couldn't get, I couldn't get off the tee to save my soul. I was always hitting recovery shots. Mm-hmm. And then this year came up. <laughs> and for whatever reason, I'm playing the same way I did in 16, 17, 18, and 19. That's it. Well, Steve, we're gonna have to see it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get out there. I'm, uh, it, I'm, I'm glad to hear. I'm glad to hear it that you're, that you're hitting it well. So I, I better do well next week because next week the other Big Ten announcers we're getting together in Columbus, and we're playing. So oh, man. I need to be on my A game, right? Because you know, I mean, Keels is there from Ohio State, Fisher from Indiana, Grimm from Minnesota, West Durham from the ACC network. I mean, it's kind of like. Dude, I can't. I I have to rep. I have to represent yeah, here. You do. You have, you're repping Penn State hard. I have Steve. to rep. I have to represent. I have to. I can't let you guys down. No, uh, no. We're you're uh, you're carrying the whole weight of uh, Penn State on your back. We better see you at the blue course on the range this coming week. <laughs> you will getting ready for this event. You will, Steve. Last thing I want to ask you: player you are most excited about for this upcoming football season, and not. Not like a Nick Singleton or a on. Let's get someone a little more. Uh, yeah, somebody off the beat. Yeah, path, right? yeah. Not like an Abdul Carter or right, something like right. that. Right, right. We know what we're getting. Okay, so let me, uh, on defense, I'll pick two guys okay. for you. All right. I'll pick Tony Rojas, mm-hmm. and I'll pick K.J. Winston. Love it. Uh, Winston is somebody that knows how to play the game. And if you put him around the box, he'll make plays. He'll also make plays back. Rojas is not only a terrific athlete. But I put such a premium on people who know how to play. Like, you knew how to play. You could see it. Right? Olu. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was some, fun. It was with, fun. With some work. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. But Rojas knows how to play. He knows the, the proper depth of a drop and a pass. He knows how to scrape on a blitz. You know, he plays the run well. He sees where the ball is. And that, that would be on that side. On the offensive side, a couple of guys on the offensive side that I'm excited to watch play would be Tyler Warren at tight end. Because I think he has he has a lot of great natural gifts, and he'll have an, the ability now to get many more reps. Because, I mean, you know, he and Theo were splitting. They were all out there a lot in a two tight end set. Yeah. And then on the offensive line, two guys, Nick Dawkins – at center. I'm just so excited to watch him playing. And then Anthony Donko. There you go. That's that's uh, my right there. I love it. Donko is Donko mostly as you know, last year Donko mm-hmm. mostly played guard in practice. And you know, and, and we you know, our people do move people around. Right? And so every once in a while he takes some reps at tackle. We get to the Peach Bowl. He's out there playing tackle full time. And he had a terrific game. No one no one knew that Caden Wallace wasn't playing. And right. for a freshman offensive yeah. tackle, if no one notices you, right. that's a great thing. I, yeah, and especially against yeah. a top ten opponent. Right. I, I think you're dead on there. I'm really excited about right. Anthony Donka. And see, a guy like Dawkins, everybody's on their own clock. And that's something like I try to impart to fans as often as possible. Just because a guy isn't playing as a freshman, maybe he's getting a few reps as a sophomore. Like, but maybe the clock kicks in when they're a junior. Mm-hmm. And this is where we go back to the listening part. Penn State had a player, basketball, Bruce Blake. And Bruce Parkhill is trying to get the program going. And Tom Hovass, who's now the head coach of the Japanese men's Olympic team. Oh, wow. So Tom Hovass is the best player on the team. And Hovass right out of the gate is playing really well. And Eddie Fogle, right, out of Hatboro Horsham, playing really well. And I said to Bruce Parker, I said, let me ask you about Bruce Blake. That'll be a practice. I said, I see some flashes here and there. I said, what, I said, what do you think? He says, Steve, you'll be okay now. He'll be okay next year. I said, but when he's a junior, I said, he's going to take off. Okay. So I made a mental note. 
night. There was enough room in here to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Stored it. <laughs> right? He got to be a junior. Landon, he took off. And I never forgot that story because that was a coach recognizing that, hey, be patient. When the clock hits, he'll go. His clock just isn't ready yet. And every player is on their own clock. I've seen guys come in here, and as a fifth-year player, it kicks in. I'm like, wow, okay. And so I've always been exponentially patient with players because of those stories about I see it, I think it's going to happen. When he gets his chance and everything falls into place confidence-wise, yep. physically, the mental side of it, you know, you'll see something really good. I, I think you're dead on there. Nick Dawkins is someone we know puts in the work. Right. He Dawkins is, is that guy. He puts – he's Penn State commu- – I mean, that is the yeah. Penn State community. He is mm. uh, the man. He worked at the YMCA down here, mm. so he knows everybody <laughs> now. Uh, and he just – man, he is I, – I love him. Penn State yeah. community loves him. So we are really excited to see him get an opportunity. He is going to ball out because I know he is someone who is dedicated to his craft. But, look, Steve Jones – Thank you so much for joining me today on Behind the Wall Landon, Podcast. It I was really awesome. enjoyed it. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Yes, Thank sir. you so much for having me. Thank you. Awesome.